Good morning. This is Steve from Southern Illinois. I changed the view here in the pergola, showing you a different part of the neighborhood. Fall is coming and going quickly. We had some rains this last week and the leaves are falling off, so you know what I'm going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> I was about 10 years old. It was Christmas time and we were back. We were on the way home from Grandma's house. It was a good seven hour drive. Um, and we had to stop several times along the way. And as we got back into the car, I saw there on the floor in the back seat one of my new Christmas presents that had been trampled on and broken. And immediately an argument broke out between my, my brother and I as to who was to blame. He obviously had stomped on my toy. Well, my dad didn't let the argument go on very long before he uh, interrupted and said, what's the matter with you boys? Do you have blind feet? And all of a sudden our argument kind of ground to a halt. Blind feet. We did not understand what dad was talking about. And if you can believe this, my dad was quite a storyteller. Um, we loved listening to his stories. Still do, in fact. Uh, but as dad uh, edged the car back out onto the road and the trip began, my brother and I were hunched forward on the back seat. Dad, what do you mean, blind feet? And what he told us went something like this. Uh, Indians walked differently. They grew up wearing moccasins, whereas the white pioneers grew up wearing shoes. And when you wear moccasins, all you have between your feet and the ground is one thin le layer of leather, whereas shoes have a sole on them that provide you with a cushion and some protection. So when you walk in moccasins, you have to walk completely differently. You walk with the ball of your foot, your toes, hitting the ground first. When you walk in shoes, the heel strikes and then you roll forward. Well, the reason there's a very real reason for that. The heel only has one bone that comes into contact with the ground. And if you hit something hard like a rock or sharp like a thorn, you have very few options on how to protect your foot. You can roll to one side or to the other, but that risks a sprained ankle. You can roll forward quickly, but that puts your whole weight onto the rock or the thorn before you get into this into onto the ball of the foot. Whereas the ball of the foot has more than five bones there which creates a lot of options for movement. You can fan your toes, which raises the side of the foot. You can point your big toe, which raises the middle part of the foot. You can curl your toes, which raises the whole ball of the foot up. You can rock back onto your heel, which immediately, immediately relieves the pressure on the ball but it makes you walk differently. Think about the difference between a, between a soldier marching and a lady walking in high heels. Your stance shortens. Your whole body movement changes. And the settlers used to laugh about the Indians when they came into town, about their funny Indian walk. Now, when I was telling Vivian about this last night, she said, is that really true? Did Indians really walk that way? And you know what? I had never questioned my dad on that. I had always assumed he knew what he was talking about. 
But then I remembered that I had read in some old books from back in the early part of the 19th, the 20th century, um, uh, that that talked about settlers cracking jokes about Indians prancing into town. And last night when I got on Google, I discovered that, hey, my dad's not the only one that tells this story. Now, I personally have never known an Indian who grew up wearing moccasins. So I can't vouch for this from personal observation. But I found a scientific study where they did slow motion photography and time-lapse photography of um, a tribe of, of Native Americans in Mexico who are renowned runners. And some of them just run in sandals, which provide very little protection for the foot. And others run in, uh, in our conventional running shoes. And they found that the ones that ran in sandals used a different stride as they were running. So maybe my dad did know what he was talking about. But wearing moccasins versus shoes and the difference in stride, the Indians grew up always paying attention to the ground that they were talking on, walking on. And it just became second nature, automatic. It was as if their feet could see where they were going and they weren't having to constantly look down and concentrate on, oh, there's a rock, I better not step on it. This difference in footwear reflects a difference in perspective. Our American pioneers, the, the white people, uh, op operated with the attitude that hazards were either to be removed or overcome. Indians were much more willing to accept hazards and adapt their lives around them. So Indian footpaths went around hazards, avoided them. And in some, way, some ways, uh, they were quite efficient, okay? When, when the American pioneers came, they often followed Indian paths. But when we were using horses, sometimes those Indian paths went places that our horses couldn't. We had to change the route because the hazards that we encountered uh, were different for the horses. Uh, when we then followed up, bringing our families with us uh, in wagons, we had to do, take entirely different routes, uh, hacking through through the forest to to find a place where wagons could travel. And then when we built roads for our cars, the roads ch the paths changed again, and so did the maps. But over time, all of those obstacles have, have been addressed to some degree. Okay, when I drive down the, 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 uh, the highway in my car and I come to a river, I don't get anxious. I, I don't think, oh my goodness, how deep is the water going to be? Am I going to be able to make it across without, without uh, the, my car falling into the water? Uh, Am I going to lose my life here? And yet when you look back in history, rivers were dangerous places. So I was talking about Vivian, with Vivian about this last night. I then went on and said, you know, and when we're flying in an airplane, um, when we go over mountains, uh, we don't even think about how difficult it is to walk through that kind of terrain and how almost impossible it is to take wagons through. For us, looking down from the clouds, we see beautiful scenery. When I drive across the river, I see slow moving water. It's a romantic picture. I think, wow, wouldn't it be nice to just float down the river? And Vivian said, yeah. <laughs> and when we flew across the Pacific to, to go to New Zealand, we weren't worried about storms. We weren't worried about waves. We weren't worried about 
the wind failing and us getting stuck in the middle of the ocean. We weren't worried about our ship sinking. Oh, yeah, it's the Pacific down there. The hazards were meaningless for us. And yet, why was that? It was because all of these changes happen because I'm driving on a road following a map that takes me to the safe path to the places where obstacles have been overcome, where hazards have been removed. Same thing is true of air travel. I'm depending on technology that has been developed over a century to allow us to safely go where no man has gone before. Perhaps we need to rethink what freedom means. I live in a free country. Uh, before COVID, there were absolutely no restrictions on travel. I could go wherever I wanted to in the entire United States and never have to show identification. Uh, I had to pass through any checkpoints. It was free. But that still didn't mean that I could walk into your house as a stranger, unannounced. It still didn't mean that I could park my car in your flower bed. Freedom is not the absence of rules. It's not lawlessness. Freedom means living within boundaries, within rules, within a set of laws that both protect us from hazards and empower us to live lives of abundance and joy. No one I know wants to live in a world where children are disrespectful of their parents, where people murder, steal, lie, cheat, betray other people. No one wants their husband or their wife or their boyfriend or girlfriend to cheat on them. And yet, is it consistent for us as religious people, as Christians in particular, to embrace these elements of what the Bible calls God's law? And yet, when that same law says, Remember that I set aside Saturday as a holy day of rest. You don't have to work on that day. Spend it with me. And we take offense at that. Is that consistent? Picking and choosing from God's law saying, yeah, that applies. No, that doesn't apply. And for those of us who are spiritual but not religious, Aren't we just as inconsistent when we pick and choose from morality? Treating it as if it's a buffet line where we are free to choose some things because they're attractive, but no broccoli, please. I'm not trying to point fun at anybody, Christian or otherwise. What I am trying to do is make us think. Walking through life with blind feet always results in us trampling on things that are precious. Relationships, health, equality, justice, Are your feet blind? Are mine? Be safe, friends. Be prudent. This uh, last week, um, I told you last week that um, we had experienced a surge in COVID here in Southern Illinois. Uh, that only lasted for three days and then volume dropped back down. But that three day surge 
has stressed our health care system to the max. Only three days of a surge in COVID and all of our referral hospitals are full. St. Louis was, the, the, the university hospitals were refusing to accept any transfers except level one trauma. Evansville was out of beds. The Carbondale was filled. Other hospitals were refusing to accept anybody outside of their county because they were afraid of being over full. So be prudent, my friends. Be safe. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week. Well, maybe not. You see, I'm starting something new this week. I'll put a link in a comment below this video. Uh, I'm going to start start uh, following up these little devotionals with what I'm going to call text talks. For those of you that would like to dive deeper into why I think the way I do, not that there's anything special, but if you're interested, the text talks are going to look at just a few of the Bible passages that shape my world view relative to what we've talked about here in the Sabbath devotionals. So I'll put a link below to, to step over to our church uh, Facebook feed, and you're welcome to join me there if you want. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week.